Well, hi folks, and welcome to episode 136 of Retro Power Uncut. And you find me staring at camera through a uh, <laughs> a uh, long bridge uh, cage. We'll we'll miss out the other word that Jarkel used to describe it, but. Uh, through a, uh, a web of uh, temporary brace tubes that have been tacked in place in a Allegro body shell to enable it to not change shape too much from its factory incorrect shape um, during its mating session with a uh, sh slightly shortened Honda Integra DC2 floor pan, which is going quite well. The uh, objectives so far this, well, this week basically, were to create six points which we can bolt the body shell to the floor pan via that will be repeatable points that we don't move so we don't have to do any alignment each time we drop the body shell on and off because there's going to be a few cycles of fitting and unfitting the body shell. Uh, several of which have already been done and several more will be done late, well, end of today and into tomorrow as well with Thursday today. We'll go into tomorrow as well. Um, so that's the first stage that uh, Scott's been working on really, is getting these, just these little uh, temporary mounting points. There's a couple here, a couple up there, and there's a couple on the, in the back tying into the old rear seat backrest uh, mount points. That just gives us a repeatable point to work to. And then Scott's been doing some of the further modifications, trimming some more sections of the Honda bulkhead. He will be trimming out some more sections of the Integra. We're going to take the, uh, sorry, the Allegro. We're going to be taking out the original dash backing area. The new dash that will be going in this car will have a lot of nods and, and, and possibly some of the original components um, of the original Allegro dash. We, we're trying to keep the theme of the original car to a reasonable extent inside, as in the original Allegro inside. However, to do some of the metal work, we need to remove this um, because one of the areas that needs to be tied together is the lower windscreen seam needs tying into the Honda scuttle, which it will do very nicely, but this is in the way of doing that. So we're going to remove this uh, and we also need to tie in some at the front. And one of the other tasks we've got to do, which is probably going to necessitate taking out some bracing, so we might have to get around that, is to temporarily fit the Honda HVAC unit just to see how that all ties in but we're pretty confident that that will fit behind the or the bulk of it will fit behind the Allegro dash so that'll be handy so that's going on the next stage of fabrication uh, that's sort of immediately obvious is this gap here uh, which we are going to we're going to fabricate a an extension to the Honda sill we've the, the top part of the Honda sill was originally chamfered outwards we need to get rid of that chamfer and straighten it. Rather than bend that straight, we've cut it off, and then we're going to put a secondary section of sill onto that to extend the Honda inner sill up to the correct height to mate with the original Allegro doorstep there. And then we're going to fabricate a complete new outer um, reinforcer sill uh, that goes onto the outside of that, and then so like an inner sill, an inner reinforcer, if you like, and then a completely new outer sill to replace the. Allegro outer sill which will then become one with the new Honda structure as well and that will at that point join the body shells in terms of sill structure. Uh, if you anybody's familiar with the renderings of the of these cars uh, which 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 have been have been shown certainly they were on Instagram for a little while um, you would notice that the sills are much wider on the renderings and we we speculated on various ways of doing that. What we're actually doing is a kind of a halfway house. We're going to widen the sill structure in the steel, but not to the final body line. And then there will be a carbon fiber trim. Um, it will be painted carbon, not, not visible carbon, but there'll be a painted but carbon molded trim that then goes over that to give us the final body line. Because as we've mentioned before, the quarter panels are also being remade. Uh, they'll be drawn in CAD, widened, and there'll be much wider wheel arches on the front and rear, the front wings and the rear quarters, and the quarters and the wings, and indeed the entire front end and the sill structure will all be moulded in carbon fibre from tooling machines to from CAD drawings. So all that is yet to come. But the, the current focus is to get the main structures tied together so that then the, or the uh, Allegro body shell can be permanently part of the Integra floor pan and that's all becomes one piece, which is looking really good. There'll be a few weeks of work in that, but that's all looking very good. Once we get it to that stage, we'll then be able to actually get the car rolling 
as, as, a, as a rolling shell um, with it all as one piece, but without the outer bodywork done. That'd be quite exciting. It'd be quite cool to see that rolling around as a, as a part-built vehicle all on the Honda suspension. So, so yeah, that's pretty much where we're at on that. It's sort of steady. There'll be quite a few weeks of steady progress, but it is quite amazing how well the two cars fit together. Once we'd overcome a few areas of stumbling blocks of how to tie structures in together, uh, it's amazing how well uh, the two come together. In fact, I'm going to walk around this side and just explain another bit to camera. Um, because it's quite obvious, it's quite interesting looking at the widths of the structures here that things have actually panned out quite well. Once you pare back the layers, um, you can see how, how it's possible to tie the structures together. And here's a, here's a case in point. This is the original bulkhead end from the uh, DC2 Integra. And that's obviously the original outer uh, door post on the Allegro. The Allegro structure is horrendously weak. Uh, it, it, there's no strength to it, any of it at all. So e e even if we cut half of the DC2 floor pan away, I still think just the floor pan on its own would probably be stronger than the Allegro. Um, but yeah, we're going to shorten this bulkhead to basically in line with the original inner A panel here, reflange it um, about 40, it's 40 mil 41 millimetres, I think, in board but leave this uh, inner wing reinforcement structure, the original DC2 inner wing reinforcement structure here. And then we'll extend the A panel forward to that new flange, spot weld that down there, uh, spot weld that to the new flange. And then we're going to extend the inner wing reinforcer back as it was on the Honda, but it was tied into the scuttle ends on the Honda as separate pressings. On this, we're going to extend this reinforcer back and into the forward edge of the Allegro A post and then gusset that in down here. So that's all tied in structurally there. And then we'll tie in the wing mounting rail to the original Allegro scuttle ends. And that'll give us an enormous amount of strength in that area and tie all that structure back together, make all that as one and make it sort of as, as a factory structure. Obviously the outer wings will be carbon, as I've said, so their mounting is kind of independent of all this at the moment. This, this section here will need to be remade to a new line. That's the original um, Integra wing mounting rail, which is obviously the wrong profile, surprisingly close to the right profile, but not the right profile. The Allegro bonnet actually sits a little bit higher, so there's a, a, a little bit of height here. So what we'll do, once that's all done, then we'll remake the uh, inner wing top rail, which is actually a separate piece. It's actually a spot welded on section. I presume that the underneath pressings were used by Honda on other cars and that they changed this top pressing to suit the DC2 body shell as opposed to the Civic body shell or something like that. I don't know all the ins and outs. But anyway, that pressing there will be removed and we'll make a new pressing to replace that, which will give us the joint to our new carbon wings and carbon front end parts. So that's where we're at on that. As I say, going back to the HVAC unit, we've actually worked out how we can do, we can use the original Allegro air intake in the scuttle here to feed the air into the scuttle area. We'll use the original Integra DC2 air intake to feed the or complete original Integra DC2 HVAC system, complete with the flaps, the heater and aircon matrices, and all, all of the other parts will be completely Honda in that. But we can feed the air in via that to those and the only change we've really got to make to the uh, HVAC system is that the original air out for the screen demist came through a slot that's under here which now will be the air intake area so we need to blank that and we'll modify the HVAC unit via one of the screw-on outlet parts that's on it we'll take that off and we'll design our own 3D print that in carbon reinforced plastic um, to give us some new air outlets to feed the new screen vents instead of feeding up through there but other than that the HVAC system can basically be pure Honda and will feed perfectly through the scuttle structure from the original air intake so it's all, all falling into place really quite nicely and a lot of the detail so yeah it's uh, coming along very well moving on from that we'll skip past this bench uh, Sam's run off to give us a bit of quiet for a minute um, just because it's uh, he's undertaking noisy operations once again on the uh, on the smashing table uh, he's beating out the inner wheel arch tub lips um, which you'll probably recall I did on the Project One Escort. Uh, Sam's doing that for Project Kuma, the second Mark One Escort. Obviously Tom's getting on with the um, outer arches, getting them grafted into the car, but as soon as they're grafted into the car we need the inner arch lips to be able to extend the wheel arch tubs out to meet the outer arches. 
um, and we make those on the same tool so that they definitely fit perfectly together then we can spot weld them together nicely so he's beating those out they're a smaller blank they're a little bit harder to hold because they're a smaller blank but equally they're easier to make because because they're narrower there's less shrink to deal with less less material to move so so uh, he, he's getting through those getting them smashed into shape on the jigs getting them to fit and then they'll be all ready for when Tom's done with uh, working on the rest of the car. We'll pick up the work on the rest of the car in a minute because uh, we'll come over to that in a minute. We're going to walk past Jensen's CV8. Bobby's been doing some beautiful work on this. I'll try and not stand behind a gas bottle. Uh, he's been doing some uh, tube shaping. I think we might have picked up on the heater pipe work before, but he's been working on uh, shaping up some aluminium tubes and doing some flexible pipe work for getting the vacuum feed to the brake servo, getting that all done neatly and nicely and making it all look like production car stuff, which he's done a lovely job of there. He, we, took, we mentioned the washers uh, last time, I think. Uh, he's now got the washer jets installed. He's made the little brackets to hold the washer jets, got them in, tested them, they're all done. And then the bulk of his time has been in doing the seats. Again, we, we've touched on them before. It's a big job because of the way, the net, A, the car's the wrong way up really for working on understructure and B, none of the structure in the area of where the seat mounts is easy to modify for a whole raft of reasons that I can't really explain when I can't point at it. But when the car's on a rotisserie at a later date when we're doing the underside finishing, I'll point them out then. Um, but there's some really awkward bits to get at. And we are converting the seats we're using early XJS seats, but with the later XJS uh, electric seat runners so that we've got electric fore and aft seat adjust with the potential then that we've got the option to have auto seat retract just to make entry and egress a little bit easier because it is quite a tricky car to get in and out of particularly if you're not tiny um, and so we, uh, we, we we're contemplating certainly the plan is to try and make uh, make an electric seat uh, retract the downside to that is it's going to depend a little bit on the speed of the motors and we're not 100% sure that we're going to have enough speed on the motor to make that rapid enough to be, re to pra to be practical. We're trying to juggle what, what is and isn't practical speed for a seat retract. But anyway, we'll come on to that. The key is getting a system that will fit in the space. We have very little height and none of the proprietary systems fitted to any modern vehicle that we know of anyway that can do that sort of rapid seat retract is slim enough to fit in the space. So we're actually using, as I say, the, the um, XJS electric seat runners, which are incredibly thin. I think that they're less than 50 millimeters in height in total. <clears throat> so we're using those, but it has meant modifying the seat frames to fit them to the seats, which has been a fairly uh, tortuous job in itself. But then also we needed to move the seats inboard from their original mounting positions, simply because if you sit in a CV8 and you have broad shoulders, you'll realise that your, your right shoulder in a right-hand drive car is basically against the B-pillar. It's really not a comfortable uh, driving position to be in. So we've moved the seats inboard by 25 millimetres. Moving them inboard by 25 millimetres is easier said than done if you're at all familiar with the chassis structure on one of these, which is why Bobby's been extremely dirty, very covered in grinding dust, and um, running a little thin on patience probably, although he doesn't say it, but, uh, but he's about there now and he's got the seats mounted in the correct positions and all working and I believe there's a little bit of footage of the, uh, of the motor drives operating the seats and uh, doing what they should do. So yeah, that's progressing nicely. So more and more of all of the, uh, the ducks being lined up in a row, we're getting this to the stage where all of the little metalwork jobs that you wouldn't necessarily think of as fabrication and metalwork jobs in themselves but they all need do, doing prior to the car being painted and prior to the car being put through to uh, the assembly workshop. So there's plenty of other bodywork to be done, but we're trying to get through all the dry build jobs, all of the, uh, all of the little, little easily forgotten jobs while we can. So that's where we're at on that. Churchill, uh, I don't know which side we're going to be best viewing this from. Probably this side, actually. Um, very, very happily for George and me, really, because we kind of co-conceived the suspension plan um, and it works. <laughs> we pre re briefly recapping on what we talked about before, we wanted to redesign the front suspension. 
we had done a redesign of the steering on Mark II Jag for a previous project and we were reasonably happy with it but there are still significant limitations on the geometry given the constraints of working with the Mark II Jaguar wishbones, uprights and cross member uh, which is what we would worked with before. On this having chased our tails for a little while in that circle again, we decided to totally abandon the plan of using any of those parts and fabricate our own cross member using some alternative parts. When Jaguar developed the XJ40 as a replacement for the Series 3 XJ6, they redesigned the front suspension. One of the, one of the major things they did was totally redesign the front suspension. And in my view, they did that quite well. And the new wishbones they designed were designed to offset the upright in a manner that meant that they could use uh, a, an upright with, um, with good geometry, without going into lots of detail, an upright with good geometry and all the steering geometry would be correct but there weren't problems with the limitations on lock due to the wheel hitting the wishbone, which is the significant problem with Mark II Jaguar and all of the Series XJ type front ends, is that if you run reasonable size front wheels, they hit the wishbones. That problem is alleviated by using XJ40, X300, X308 front end setup. So that's what we've done, but obviously we needed to narrow it to suit the Mark II Jaguar. So George has sat down at his computer and with a little bit of guidance has drawn up complete front cross member, which uses complete, completely standard uh, X300, XJ40, X308, all the same. So I can, if I keep mixing up what I call them, they're all the same. Uh, later Jag XJ front lower arms which are a big forged steel item with two pieces with a big spring pan bolted onto them uh, so it takes the standard ones of those but obviously moved inboard it uses nearly standard upper wishbones ignore the fact these are welded together ones we're going to machine these these are fairly easy to machine in billet we're going to machine the upper wishbones for the moment just for mock-up we've literally they need to be shortened by 15 millimeters that's dictated by the inner wing space we can't move the inner wings we can't do anything with the inner wings because of the ancillaries on the engine uh, to for clearance on the ancillaries and it, Actually, when you do a camber curve for the front suspension on these, there's almost no camber compensation. And actually, we decided that it would be beneficial to have a little bit more camber compensation. So shortening the upper arm a little actually did make sense. So we've now got a 15 millimeters shorter upper arm, stock bottom arm, the camber curve's really nice. The steering geometry is really nice. I think I mentioned before, by happy coincidence we've ended up finding a uh, Detroit a rack from Detroit speed in the States that's within one millimeter of the ideal length uh, in terms of our um, bump steer uh, geometry um, so that's all worked out really well we've got the um, steering rack mounts are mocked up in place at the moment we're just waiting for the delivery of the actual rack to do us final check everything before we fully weld all of those but yeah we, we now have significant steering lock in both directions on a this is a 245 tire on what i believe is an eight inch wheel but it might be eight and a half i'm not sure um, but it's certainly a 245 section uh, tire from the rear of an a jaguar xjr um, and it steers to a pretty significant lock both ways without hitting things um, which is to, if anybody knows their Mark II Jaguars will know that's a significant problem. Um, so yeah, we're really happy with that. We've put it through its travel. We've got to formulate the final spec for the coilovers and then speak to a manufacturer about getting those made. And we need to make the coilover mounts to the bottom arm, which I was just talking to George about a few minutes ago. But yeah, we're, we're really happy with that. Stu's been be beavering away, getting all that in place. Mount, the, getting the cross member mounted to the jig solidly so that then he can fabricate the new mountings between the cross member and the rails. One thing we couldn't do, which annoyed us a little bit, but there was no way around it, is we couldn't make the mounting of this work with the original uh, Mark II Jaguar front cross member mounts. The front mounts are actually almost standard, but not quite, annoyingly. The rear mounts are nowhere near standard. We've had to modify them quite drastically just because they're in the wrong place as standard. There's no way they can fit, you know, it just doesn't work. So um, 
you know, that's, uh, that's how it is. We've, we've had to modify those, and that's just the, the best we can do. Um, so it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a setup that could be retrofitted to a, a standard Mark II Jag. That said, it doesn't require any cutting of the chassis rails. It's just altering of the bracketry on the chassis rails themselves. So, yeah, really, really pleased with uh, where we're at on that. And then moving along to over here, we have the Project Kuma second Mark I Escort and Tom's been busy beavering away on this metal finishing this wheel arch I think he was welding this in last week uh, he's now most of the way through metal finishing he's had a bit of a battle on his hands in a couple of places and he's actually looking at that he's actually sorted out the, uh, the, the, the one problem area he's having issues with so he's pretty much getting there with the primary metal finishing on this obviously it'll need a little bit more once the inner arches are in so I imagine he's pretty close to now getting set on grafting in the second rear wheel arch to the other side. So yeah, this will be the next few, probably next two weeks, if you're seeing the wheel arches getting grafted in uh, and all the metal finishing being done on those. And then this is getting perilously close to uh, the end of metal work. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten that we talked about doing a, a, an episode just focusing on the wheel arches. We will do that once we're a little bit further along the line and once I've had enough breathing space from doing other things like modifying things around the unit and doing, doing construction work, uh, we'll do a little compilation episode with a full talk through of the whole process from start to finish on how these arches are made. In, uh, the, the interesting bit of that will be this will be one way of doing it and then when we go to do the Allegro project, uh, the Lucky Strike, uh, we'll be able to show you another way of doing it because we'll be doing the same sort of job but in carbon fibre on that. Pros and cons, uh, not even really, the, 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 both, job, bo both ways of doing the job have their advantages and disadvantages and both were chosen for specific reasons on these two projects. So you'll be, uh, it'll be interesting for you to be able to see both, both processes all the way through from start to finish. That's about where we're at on the escorts and then last but not least in here, nestling in the paint booth. I'm going to open the door actually and show you in here because you'll see one of the less glamorous parts of the uh, one, one of the one of the less glamorous parts of the job that comes with uh, comes with this. This is the Project One Escort. The interior body colour paintwork has now been done, which is a I don't know what grey it's called, but it's a grey uh, finish, a, a blue grey, and the uh, the inside of the A pillars and the surrounds for the uh, rear quarter windows. The roll case, the roll case is actually going to be trimmed, but guys has painted it all anyway, just in case there's any areas where with the stitching on the leather and whatever else. We haven't quite decided exactly how the joins in the leather are being done. So just in case there's any areas where it does become obvious, it's all painted anyway, so there's no questions. So he's done all the areas of the interior body colour. So the next stage is painting, painting the rest of it. And prior to that, the guys are doing a full clean down on the booth. And re, we use a peelable booth, booth coat, which you can see half peeled off in here at the moment. Um, that traps the dirt and keeps the place looking fresh. See all the walls are nice and white behind that. Uh, that's all coming off, being redone, do the floor filters, get everything clean, the whole place all ready and spruce before we do the final paint. We do all our, we only have one booth, we don't have a separate primer booth like some companies. We don't do enough paint work really to justify having a second booth, sadly. Um, so we use one booth, which means that particularly between the high build epoxy primer and the Raptor, we get a lot of build up in the filters and we get a lot of build up on the walls. Um, and it's Good practice, and Gaz likes to get it all clean in here before we do a final paint on a car. And it, usually, the, 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 with the number of cars we paint, it kind of works out that it's due, it's well due for a clean by the time we get to doing the final paint. Obviously, we're painting more; it wouldn't work out that way, but that's kind of how it works out. So, yeah, they're getting all the uh, peelable booth coat off, which generally works okay, apart from where it's gone on a bit thin, and then it's a bit like picking bits of skin off. It's a bit awkward. All the raptors, yeah. that's it. Uh, yeah, and there's areas where it's kind of dried out a bit, and yeah, the raptors got through little patches on it and stuff. But yeah, they're getting through with cleaning all that up. And then it's a marathon effort spraying all of the new peelable booths go on everything and uh, then pulling all the floor filters out. Full floor extract booths, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant for overspray reduction and great for airflow. The downside is a hell of a lot of filters to pull out and get rid of once you, uh, once you do it. And these grid plates are not particularly light once you've lifted, I don't know how many there are, quite a lot. But once you've lifted all of those grid plates out, your arms know about it by the end of the day. So uh, yeah, 
So that's where we're at with that. And I think at that point, I'm going to hand over to Cal in the assembly shop to catch up on progress in there. Uh, thank you very much, Nat. Uh, and I'm going to start with the Land Cruiser, because this has really been the focus of the attention in here this week. Um, starting with buttoning up the cooling system. Uh, I've just put my hand on this and it nearly burnt my hand, which is to give away us to the end of this conversation. Um, we had these pipes back from anodizing last week. So beginning of the week, got the cooling pipes in, got the remaining heater pipes uh, clipped up and that was the last bit before we could fill it with uh, coolant. That went well, no leaks on that, which is, I, that's got to be a first, I reckon. If there's, if there's anybody watching who's, uh, who's built a car and filled it with coolant the first time, not had a single drip from anywhere, you're doing well. <laughs> Um, and actually, um, remarkably, I think for the first time ever, this ticked that box. Um, so coolant in, and then uh, the next thing we needed to do was get ready to crank it for oil pressure. And if you think back a couple of episodes, we were trying to get the transmission cable sorted so we could get the sump pan on the transmission, get the oil filled on the transmission, which we've now done. Um, and that was the last step before we could turn it over. Um, so beginning of this week, I was just working on the last bits of PDM program because when I did the PDM calibration for this, I never programmed the start and, and ECU power channels and the power to the lambda to can unit. Um, so I needed to get the remaining calibration in for that so I could turn it off on, turn it on on the key, um, crank it over, we take spark plugs out so there's no load on the bearings, cranked it over. Um, and yeah, very quickly got, uh, got good pressure. Um, at one leak which was on one of the connections onto the oil cooler and this pipe hanging out the front here might be some clue to the fact that we were unable to solve that leak because it actually looks like it's a fault on the cooler um, one of the male um, unions on the cooler seems to have a defective um, taper on the top of it so it was only mating up with the fitting on sort of one side you could see the witness on one side of it but not all the way around and no matter how tight we did it you'd still get a tiny little dribble of oil down one side of it so for the moment we've just bypassed that for the sake of the first fire up got a new cooler on the way so that's all good um, so with coolant in we'd already done the fuel system oil pressure looking good we were basically ready for the first fire up so uh, today dave rowe who's our uh, resident well not resident but uh, go-to motec specialist uh, came over got all the initial ecu set up in there um, and we went for the first fire up which, uh, which went well um, sounds smooth as you'd expect a, a toyota one use zv8 to sound um, i think the next step we're going to do now we've, we've kind of run it briefly no major dramas what i do want to do is pull the cam covers off because um although we've got an oil pressure sender on the sort of last bit of um oil pipe work before it goes into the engine we've got no um sort of confirmation if you like that there's oil circulation around the engine so before we run it for any significant length of time i want to pull the cam covers off and make sure there's oil at the top of the of the heads there so we're getting circulation throughout um, because there's no oil pressure sender in the top of the head so you, it's something you don't know other than visually um, so we'll get them off have a look at that and if we're happy with that we could start running it for a bit longer and start doing some more work on the uh, on the map for it so at the moment it's just literally set up to just start up and fire up although it does it does so very pleasingly so uh, that's a very good start uh, in the meantime, uh, Adam has been building up the seats. Because the fuel system is now finished and we're happy that's all fine, we were able to put all the panel work in that goes over the fuel tank uh, enclosure, um, get the framework in, get the panel work in, and that's building up to getting the seats in. Um, and to that end, he's then been building up the seat frames, which uh, well, maybe if I walk over this way, you'll see they're down here. Um, so we fabricated these if you cast your minds well back into the metalwork phase on this tom made all of these frames um we've actually repurposed the hinge parts that the backs pivot on because they have these really quite nice little metal catches which are in keeping with the sort of utilitarian functional um theme throughout this car um so we repurposed those but made the frames look pretty and the whole idea was that we were going to give it sliding sliding seats because originally it had a, a single fixed seat on the driver's side which was way too close to the steering wheel for me to even be able to use the car um, so we've got you know fully slidable seats passenger seat as well although it's a double that also slides with a handle on the uh, under the sort of passenger's legs 
So we've got those together, they're ready to go in. Um, so I think probably tomorrow we'll get the rest of that fuel tank enclosure in, get these uh, seat frames in, and hopefully get the seat cushions in. Um, and I know also Adam's working on uh, the door cards. I think the, he was making the membranes earlier, which I thought were down here, but they're not. Uh, so he's just making up the plastic membranes to go on the doors before the door cards go in. Um, but we're pretty much in a position to get door cards in now uh, and get the dash top in, and that's gonna, that's gonna finish off the interior pretty nicely. Um, so yeah, it's all kind of going in the right direction on that one. Uh, let's have a little wander over here. In fact, Jamie, if you want to overtake me. Uh, Morris, I'm working through uh, fault finding the things we talked about last week. So the clutch, still a bit of a mysterious one. Uh, I was expecting to find that the slave cylinder was pressurizing up and not letting fluid get back to the master. Um, so my theory was if we get it on here, pump the clutch a load of times, if we crack the bleed nipple with the clutch released, I'd still see pressure there and you know, you get a sudden jet of fluid coming out at the bleed on the slave. But that wasn't the case. Um, so it wasn't an immediate tick, yes, that's definitely it. I'm still reasonably convinced it is something to do with the master cylinder though. So w what I did on this occasion was blow um, air, sort of low pressured air back up from the slave back to the reservoir via the master, um, just to make sure there's not any debris got caught in the, in the master cylinder drillings. Um, and then dropped all the fluid out and refilled it. And I'm gonna take it for another drive in that state and see what happens there. Um, and it's, I'm still not sure whether it corresponds to it being warm or the number of times you press the clutch. So the next time we go out, I'm gonna bring it back on the pit when it's hot and do the, do the sort of pumping the clutch a lot and seeing if there's any pressure built up in there to see if it maybe relates to it being hot. But so we're essentially in process with that. And then I've now got the filter here that I'm gonna use on the power steering feed. So I'm literally in the middle of the job of sucking the power steering fluid back out of it to just take the pressure relief valve, clean that up, and then we'll remake the feed pipe to have that filter on it. And then uh, we'll be out for the next series of test drives then. Uh, and then having a little look over that way. Um, E-type, we've been doing the lambda bosses in the exhaust manifolds. So we're basically gearing up to get the whole exhaust system in. Um, wanted to get some lambda bosses in those. They needed quite precise positioning just because of how close they sit to everything and us not wanting the lambdas to be hanging down under the car. Um, so getting the position sorted for those, drilling the, <laughs> drilling the holes in the stainless, which is always an absolute pain in the tits, um, getting those bosses welded in, which is about ready to go now. We did notice though, while we were doing that, the um, adjustable, the brace that goes across under the sump, which is part of the um, adjustable torsion bar kit that we bought for the car. We noticed actually that brace piece is extremely close to the sump. and uh, It's got clearance, but I would guess it's like three millimeters. And obviously with the movement of the engine, we're worried that might touch. So we're actually, we've whipped that off and we're gonna just mill out a couple of notches in that to give it a bit more clearance. Um, then that, once that's done, that can go back on and then we can actually get all the exhaust system buttoned up on it now. Um, so that is an exciting step forward on that. And then the Camaro, I think, I'm just trying to think whether there was any progress on that this week. Prop shaft, yes, well reminded. Well reminded. That, you might also notice over here, Anthony, who's just been doing a couple of days, trial days with us. So we may or may not see more of this man in the future, who knows? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he's been working on the exhaust manifolds for the E-Type over the last couple of days. Um, and yes, putting the prop shaft on. And then we we're also just doing some of the spanner check work on the E-Type, uh, mindful of the fact that once the exhaust goes on, uh, you can no longer access some of the bolts quite very easily. So we're getting on with that. So yeah, that's where we're at. A um, Couple of things I'm gonna end on is one, we, a few episodes ago, we started inviting questions at the end of the video and people would post questions in the comments and we would answer them in the next episode. And somehow along the way, through all the carnage, I think of mezzanine builds and stuff, we forgot about that. Um, so any questions about the business or about the cars, feel free to post them in the comments and those that look popular get a lot of likes or are asked a lot, we'll uh, try and answer in the following episode. Uh, and other than that, don't forget in our web shop, um, mugs, coffee, t-shirts, hoodies. I mean, t-shirts are probably a good one at the minute because I, th I think, although it's pouring with rain today, hopefully we'll be into good weather pretty soon. So uh, excited to for car season to kick in properly. Uh, and on that note, we'll see you next week.